Hi, just a quick video because I raised this question of myself on Twitter as I do all the time I, after seeing this article in PV magazine, major milestone for world's biggest solar project. The world's biggest solar and storage project is a step closer to realisation as the government of Australia's Northern Territory, that's up in the north by the way in case you didn't know, and Singapore based Sun Cable have signed a deal uh, to advance the development of the Australia ACEAN Powerlink. Um, basically Australia to Asia uh, power link pretty much and the artist rendition of what it's going to look like um, there goes the Northern Territory but there's a lot of room up in the Northern Territory and yes that's exactly what the Northern Territory looks like um, minus the solar panels at the moment um, so yes lots of sun up there and uh, lots of open space flat open space our solar insulation here in Australia is second to none insulation not insulation. Um, and anyway, let's let's have a read. Plans continue to gather steam to develop a 10 gigawatt solar farm and a 30 gigawatt storage facility near Tennant Creek in Australia's Northern Territory in order to export solar power to Singapore via submarine transmission link. This project will transform the territory into a renewable energy powerhouse, as we call it, just the territory. Uh, the solar farm and battery storage facility will be built across 12,000 hectares. Ha, that's a hobby farm, as uh, <laughs> Crocodile Dundee said. Anyway, at uh, Powell Creek Station, about 70 kilometres southwest of Elliott and Northern Territory's Barclay region, as well as the region's climatic advantages, the facility will capitalise in close access to road uh, and rail infrastructure. Once operational power from what will be Australia's largest renewable energy infrastructure project will be exported via high voltage DC uh, transmission link connecting uh, the precinct to the Darwin Catherine interconnected system. Power will then be transported via a 3,800 kilometre high voltage DC submarine cable to Singapore. The project is expected to generate enough renewable electricity to power more than 3 million homes a year. In Singapore, that is. Um, so I guess it's cost effective to build this infrastructure in Australia and transport it 3,800 kilometres to Singapore. Woo. And it will supply up to 20% of Singapore's electricity needs. It is estimated the project will inject up to 8 billion Aussie dollary dues into the regional economy with about 1,500 jobs, blah, blah, blah. $1 billion worth of solar electricity per year upon completion. It export. Wow. So the commences in 2023, commercial operations in 2027. Yeah, it's going to take a long time to build all of that. <laughs> Not only to manufacture the pen, imagine installing that. You get the contract, you little... <laughs> Piss ant company, you, know, oh, you bid for the contract. Oh, geez, how many panels? <laughs> it's just Arthur's impression, of course. I don't know how physical, I haven't calculated how physically large it would actually be. But anyway, it got me thinking well, how much power does Singapore use, and what is 20% of that, and what are the losses to transport this 3,800 kilometers under the ocean via cable to Singapore? As it turns out, I've done some calculations on that, <laughs> as I do, because, well, you know, it's one thing to just you know, go, oh, that's interesting, but it's another thing to actually just get out your confuser and plug some numbers in and find out this. So let's look at some estimated losses for a system like this, shall we? Now, I actually goofed it in up here. I've gone 3,200 kilometers for some reason. It's actually 38 hundred kilometers so eh, anyway good enough for Australia we'll run with that so how much uh, power does Singapore use well around 50 terawatt uh, hours per year um, so yeah I, I just took that and we're gonna run with uh, 50 terawatt hours per year and we know it's gonna uh, supply 20% of that so it's 10 terawatt hours per year but of course that's an energy figure because it's a watt hour figure we need to work out what the uh, power is and then like so how much power it's actually transferring across the cable because it doesn't matter how much energy it transfers as energy is a time uh, component we care about the power it transfers because of the I squared R losses P equals I squared R so depending on how much power 
you're sending across, that's going to be that's going to be X amount of current at X amount of voltage, and therefore X amount of power loss in your cable. And that's what we want to calculate. So I've assumed 500 kilovolts and a 1300 square meter cable. Where did I get these from? Well, let's have a look. High voltage uh, DC transmission here. Um, I, this is like a typical like one of these uh, submarine power cables. Okay, and this is the Wikipedia article. Conductor sizes typically like 12. Uh, less than 1200 square millimeters but sizes up to 2400 uh, square millimeters have been used occasionally and I found this over here which was a high voltage uh, some sort of article and this shows here we go here's a typical uh, cable look different to the other one the other one had the three cores in it didn't it yeah, that one there's got uh, three cores. By the way, I've done a video on this, um, which is uh, the 140 megawatt Woolnorth uh, wind farm in Tasmania, which I visited. And uh, yeah, I'll link in that video there. And there's a, some cross section of some cables that I looked at there. And uh, it's Huxley's hand. There I am at the wind farm. <laughs> what face is that? It's very windy there. Um, that gets the cleanest air in the world, by the way. If you want to find out why, I guess watch my video. I think I mentioned it in there. But anyway, yeah, Tasmania. Yeah, ripper. Anyway, so I, I use 1300 square millimeters here for a typical high voltage DC under C cable. This one's actually uh, 250 kilovolts. Uh, typical voltages because it's the you know the dielectric of the uh, thing has to withstand this. You know, 420 kilovolts, 520 kilovolts. So I just took like 500 kilovolts as a typical figure. I think yeah, you know, somebody on Twitter mentioned like up to one megavolt or something like that. But anyway, let's just run with 500 kilovolts. That seems to be a you know a reasonable figure. So how much power does it uh, transfer? We don't actually know, so we've got to just like, uh, like sort of just have a guess. Let's say 10 terawatt hours. Well, let's uh, convert that uh, to power. Uh, in, so divided by 365 days a year, divided by 24 hours in a day, you get 1.14 gigawatts. That's close enough to 1.21 gigawatts with a J gigawatts. So we're going to run with 1.21 gigawatts. Whoa, this is it. This is the part coming up, Doc. This sucker's electrical, but I need a nuclear reaction to, to generate the 1.21 gigawatts of electricity. What did I just say? But I need a nuclear reaction to, to generate the 1.21 gigawatts of electricity. 1.21 gigawatts! 1.21 gigawatts! Great Scott! So power, of course, equals voltage uh, times current. So 1.21 gigawatts into the flux capacitor divided by 500 kilovolts. We're talking 2420 amps. So I'm going to run with that. You know, that seems quite reasonable for a current flowing through one of these bad boys. So then we need to know what the resistance of the cable is. Well, I just chose a random online wire resistance calculator. I did double check that this uh, value with another calculator came out the same. So we're talking uh, 3200 kilometers here okay 3200 kilometers so you've got to put there it is 3200 meters times a thousand uh and with our 1300 square millimeter uh cross-sectional area which is a you know reasonable figure it could be more could be less but let's run with that uh that gives us 42 ohms thank you very much i'm um, 42,000 milliohms a few milliohms fanboys a 42 good number 42 so we'll run with that so at 42 ohms and 3,200 kilometers, once again, multiply this for my 3,800 kilometer goof. Uh, P equals I squared R. These are your famous I squared R losses. Good terminology to use. Uh, same, oh, losses in the cable. I squared R losses. You know, that's just the lingo. Um, 2420 amps squared times 42. Put that into confuser. You get 245 megawatt loss. That's actually huge. So if you divide that by your 1.21 gigawatts into your flux capacitor, that's 20 percent cable loss now look they're not gonna no one's going to accept a 20 percent cable loss so uh, ways around that of course are to use uh, thicker cable use a higher voltage and of course uh, when you ta start talking square factors uh, that can reduce it a lot so if you just simply run two of these identical uh, cables side by side yeah you double your cost because copper is expensive uh, and you know cost for laying it out and it's probably a cost between difference between laying one or two cables at the same time doesn't really matter because you've got to have the ship and you've got to lay the damn thing or like dig the trenches or whatever and then build the facilities and oh, everything else right um, 
it's probably not <laughs> you're just paying for the extra copper really so that would be a 61 that would be 61 megawatts so a quarter because you've halved the uh, current it'd be uh, 1210 amps now uh, so it because that's a squared factor i squared r um, if you have the current then the, the power goes down by a factor of four but so that's only 61 megawatts as opposed to 245 megawatts so that's around about a five percent loss because a quarter of the loss uh 20 percent before five percent now but but because you've got two cables 61 megawatts uh, loss in each now it's a total system loss of 10 percent and you know these are reasonable uh, ballpark figures and do they actually uh match what's you know typical figures out there well after i did this <laughs> i could have skipped on this and just read this document here which i'll link in uh it's where is it um and we have, we're page 11 of 79 so what is it jrc technical report european commission high voltage dc submarine power cables in the world state of the art knowledge 2015 you know it's not that old so if we go down to here um yeah they just give us typical figures here it is dc and ac flow in a conductor uh the skin effect where of course high voltage dc system so none of that skin effect uh rubbish and look they give you uh look a thousand or two thousand kilometers uh like 6.4 <laughs> 6400 6.4 gigawatts okay so this is a much bigger um system so look it looks like you know bigger systems exist than this one so i thought oh geez this is huge i mean no, apparently for these high voltage dc systems it, you know it's a bit on the runty side actually and they're saying uh 800 kilovolts here so that might be more of a standard if i saw this you know you could run the numbers again maybe and but anyway they've estimated losses three and a half to five percent so yeah that's pretty similar to where we were at so there you go if we did our calculations and you know up the voltage a bit and stuff like that like our losses um were you know fairly on par there uh using of course a, you know, a thicker cable higher voltage less losses yeah you could easily see where you get around three and a half to five you know like i'm sure this report would have uh is, is it this is two examples of losses so these are examples and these are just the loss in the power transmission cables i assume so not a loss in the actual uh, uh, then the power converters on each side of that and they've got some examples here the Zhiyang Shanghai line is the world's first ultra high voltage DC connection operates at ah oh, plus uh, right 800 kilovolts is ultra high so we'll kind of on the mark there with the uh, 500 kilowatts transfer 7.2 gigawatts um, from the hydro power in southeast China which is 2,000 kilometers away wow it's a single overhead line that's not an underwater uh, transmission line not sure if you get the 800 kilovolts um on undersea ones i don't know if anyone knows leave it in the comments down below but anyway yeah it seems like this you know these sort of you know three and a half five percent if you could get better than that i guess they'd tell you um of course you'd try and achieve but once you're down you know three or five percent loss seems acceptable ten or twenty percent you start to go uh. Uh, that's a bit sucky isn't it what are we doing this for um so because somebody's got to pay for that right <laughs> they, they're going to be charging but i wonder would australia charge singapore for the power transmitted rather than the power delivered i guess we would <laughs> why not we have to generate it so yeah i reckon the customer would probably bear the loss of the transmission ones i don't know does anyone know anyone seen these sorts of contracts let us know but uh yeah these things are possible so you know three or five percent interesting monopolar interconnectors now we get into the monopolar configuration with earth return and I <laughs> so there it is seems easy doesn't it just a transformer just a rectifier just a dc resistance line well that's true it's just a dc it's just a cable just a copper cable they don't do anything fancy they don't have to make them aluminium uh none of that aluminum rubbish aluminium because uh like they do for some of the overhead lines because of the weight copper aluminium's lighter than uh copper so the big overhead uh cables they want to get the weight down because you know they sag um it's a real big problem so anyway and then an in, in inverter no worries and a filter and no worries <laughs> sounds easy right <laughs> sounds like these are tiny little uh buildings but let's actually have a look let's actually have a look i googled high voltage dc uh power station and stuff like this i mean check out check out this wow right 
What the heck is that? You probably aren't even allowed to stand under that. Uh, check out, like, they've got, like, the metal wall seems very close to that, or is that... Oh, no, no, it's a whole thing away. Okay, I was going to say, if it's, like, close to that metal back wall, <laughs> get lucky, no fun. I don't know what I'm looking at, but damn, it's impressive. <laughs> and that's a power filter. Wow. This is great stuff. If anyone works inside, like, one of these high-voltage DC uh, converter plants, please let us know, because it's just, yeah, it's very impressive. And you might be interested why high-voltage DC instead of, like, transmitting normal, like, 50 hertz, none of that 60 hertz uh, rubbish AC. Well, uh, transmission line losses. AC, of course, uh, you get the skin effect on the cables and it reduces the efficiency of the cables. So semiconductor thyristors is able to handle 4,000 amps and block high voltages up to 10 kilovolts are needed for the widespread adoption, but they got those. Newer semiconductors, voltage source converters with transistors that can rapidly switch between two voltages has allowed power uh, DC converters. Increased benefits are long distance transmission, increased competition, because uh, like you probably couldn't do this uh, sort of in like 3,800 kilometers at 50 hertz. You probably can't do it. Whereas DC, there's no uh, skin effect. There's no AC resistance effect. There's nothing. There you go. A DC line has lower construction costs than an AC line. That's interesting. And there you go. There's a crossover point for AC versus DC. It seems to be like two, anything over 250 kilometers, it starts to become uh, better to send it over high voltage DC at plus minus 400 kilovolts as opposed to 400 uh, like AC lines, your typical towers that you're used to. They use uh, 1,200 square millimetre conductors, uh, 1,600 square millimetres over here for the high voltage uh, DC. But yeah, you can go like thousands of kilometres and losses in megawatts, um, it seems to start to add up. So once you get like, you know, 1,000 plus kilometres, that's, that's a decent amount of extra loss in there. And it looks like you can get uh, smaller lines as well. Look, for a, a 2 gigawatt uh, capacity line, you need like much smaller towers. Look at this, the uh, uh, 50 metres instead of 85 metres, 500 kilovolts DC instead of 800 kilovolts AC. So, yeah, um, and like because over many kilos, you need one of these every what, couple hundred metres or something. Uh, and your costs add up when you've uh, got to physically construct these towers. Yeah, and then, then you've got the right-of-way as well, which is uh, basically the area that they have to buy up all the homes for or, or can't allow to, not allowed to build anything else. You've got to have a corridor going through where you can't basically build anything um, under them. And uh, designed to carry um, is 70% wider for a 2 gigawatt line uh, AC than it is for DC. So that's, uh, that's significant. You've got to potentially buy up and, and waste a lot more land um, that you can't actually develop. Operation and maintenance costs are lower for an optimized high voltage DC system. There you go, than an AC system. That's interesting. Typical break even distances in terms of miles. And here it is in this case, uh, particularly suited, high voltage DC is particularly suited to undersea transmission where losses from AC are large. There you go. The first one was in Sweden. I don't want my Swedish viewers. And if you're wondering why can't we use all of the 10 gigawatts here, um, because it only, they're solar panels, they only produce power during the day. And they've got 30 gigawatts of storage. I don't know what storage technology they're going to use, but that's a metric crap ton of storage. Um, so yes, so during the, you know, the eight hours of sunshine a day or whatever you're going to get, you know, going to be profile these things, would, would they tilt them? Would they um, have a at least one big central bar that tilts them more. You'd think they'd want to try and optimize it, perhaps. I don't know. Trade off for cost, maybe. So yes, obviously, uh, some of that will go to uh, Singapore, and some of that will be used locally, and the other will go into storage, so that during the night, um, it can it can then continuously uh, send that out from the storage bank instead of uh, directly from the panels themselves. So there's no point having any storage at all if you're consuming all of the 10 gigawatts during the day. <laughs> there's just no point. None will go into storage. It'll all be just used. So there you go. That was interesting. I like running the numbers on things like this. Just get out your DaveCAD available. Yes, DaveCAD is open source and it's available on GitHub, by the way. You can actually get it. So anyway, hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. If you did, please give it a big thumbs up. As always, discuss down below, especially if you know all about this high voltage DC transmission thing. I am guarantee there's someone in my audience who works in this industry. There always is. Catch you next time.